Okay, morning everyone, and my name is Dong Chen. I'm one of the co-director of Special Co-Ag Lab. And many of the, uh, the profiles and uh, the uh, algorithm, uh, algorithm we developed throughout the years, uh, many of them are actually performed uh, in the lab, some of the pieces of the algorithm actually in our electronic uh, software. And also some, there are some, uh, do have some uh, uh, physician and uh, laboratory interface with the algorithm. So today uh, I'm going to talk about the algorithm we developed uh, and uh, used for these uh, years uh, regarding Van Willebrand disease testing. And this is a fascinating molecule. I'm very interested in this molecule because we develop a whole testing algorithm just targeting one protein and in comparison to the other uh, algorithm, uh, algorithm we developed in the past. So I have no, uh, nothing to disclose. And then today I would like to focus on three goals. One is very briefly uh, give you a, a summary of the clinical and laboratory features of a congenital Van Willebrand disease and al also acquired Van Willebrand syndrome. And then I will introduce you the algorithm we use in the laboratory and to guide us using many of the tests uh, uh, to uh, un understand this molecule and understand the Van Willebrand disease to walk away from the beginning to the end of a diagnosis. And also I will use two cases to sort of give you an a, a illustration on how we actually in a daily uh, uh, lab practice to use this uh, uh, algorithm. So as we know that uh, very briefly the Van Willebrand factor is a crucial molecule in the primary hemostasis. It's uh, very important to the first step of uh, 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 blood clotting and then the deficiency of the molecule cause Van Willebrand disease. And uh, the, the prevalence of disease is, uh, based on literature is about 1 to 0.1% and also uh, acquired Van Bleren syndrome can be actually higher. There's no uh, prevalence study, but I would imagine that either on the congenital side or the acquired side, VWF is uh, a very uh, uh, highly uh, prevalent disease among many of the other coagulopathies. So the Van Bleren disease uh, can be classified in type 1, 2, and 3. And type 1 and 3 are really uh, defining the uh, quantitative deficiency of a Van Willebrand factor, and type 2 is really the qualitative deficiency uh, describing the, uh, uh, the function deficiency of the VWF, which can be further subclassified into 2A, 2B, 2M, and 2N. 2A defines actually the uh, uh, VWF uh, multimer deficiency, and 2B is actually caused by aberrant uh, increased affinity of VWF towards um, uh, a platelet and causing a secondary uh, multimer uh, loss. And 2M is because of the de decrease of a platelet or matrix binding, the matrix de uh, uh, referring to the collagen binding, or some other, uh, and then uh, there's no usually uh, uh, deficiency of uh, VWF multimers. And then 2N is really caused by the uh, deficiency of VWF to bind to factor VIII uh, in our uh, plasma. So that's basically the lab uh, is trying to develop various assays to trying to, uh, um, to classify uh, and diagnose and classify Van Willebrand disease. And then acquired Van Willebrand disease is one of the diseases, in my own opinion, is a, a, a sort of underdiagnosed in the clinical practice. And uh, it can, uh, there are major three groups of associated diseases uh, that can cause acquired Van Willebrand syndrome. Uh, the first one is uh, due to the autoantibody uh, against the VWF. And these diseases include uh, AMGUS or my myeloma, lymphoma, or autoimmune disorders such as lupus. And I, as a matter of fact, the first case was uh, reported in 1968 was describing a patient with systemic lupus erythematosus developed autoantibody uh, against uh, uh, his own uh, VWF. The second group uh, are really uh, caused, uh, relatively common, is actually caused by shear induced VWF uh, uh, degradation by Adam TS13. These diseases are usually seen in uh, cardiovascular patient population, such as uh, aortic stenosis regurgitation, mitral stenosis regurgitation, uh, VSD, uh, a recipient of a left ventricular uh, device, or artificial heart and also uh, a myo, uh, a cardiomyopathy. And there has been, uh, we reported uh, also uh, this patient uh, can have a pulmonary hypertension. So uh, the first case was reported in 1958 in New England Journal of Medicine in a patient with aortic stenosis. 
And then, uh, and the third one is uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, thrombo uh, 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 thrombo uh, thrombocytosis, the high platelet count actually uh, cause a absorb absorbance of the uh, VWF onto the platelet and causing secondary uh, sort of a type two uh, von Willebrand uh, abnormality. And these can be seen in also other myeloproliferative neoplasm. The first report actually was found in 1984, published by Blood. So gradually, uh, these cases are seeing uh, in our experiences are not less common than uh, conge uh, congenital von Willebrand disease. They usually are very hard to diagnose, I which I will discuss. There are also other scattered case report regarding uh, certain uh, cancer, certain medication, or certain um, medical other medical conditions. But uh, based on literature uh, review and our own experience, they are uh, exceedingly rare. So now, given this classification, given we know about the clinical need. So how do we uh, use this test? So based on the uh, uh, Van Willebrand disease uh, NHLBI guideline published in 2008, um, we know that initially we need to perform a BWF antigen, BWF activity. In many labs, uh, we're doing ristocetin cofactor activity, but in our lab, we're doing the, late, the newer latex uh, uh, method. And then we have a derivative of results, which is the VWF activity over antigen ratio. And then in the literature, uh, the ratio cutoff is a 0.6 to 0.7. And for the von Willebrand disease, our cutoff is 0.7. And, uh, and then we do the factor VIII uh, activity. And then uh, we also sometimes calculate the factor VIII over antigen ratio to really uh, trying to see if there's any uh, evidence of uh, or possibility of uh, uh, hemophilia A or type 2N. So these are the three initial tests, regardless what uh, kind of sample we receive, we will always do these three based on the guideline. So in addition, based on uh, uh, the initial results and a certain clinical scenario, we add, we might consider other tests. This include a VWF multimer analysis. This is really trying to see the, uh, uh, the multimer distribution of VWF. This is trying to diagnose a 2A or 2B kind of a, a type 2 Van Willebrand disease. And also uh, in, uh, in uh, other labs or other uh, uh, reference labs uh, uh, and in, also in the literature, VWF collagen can be used as alternative VWF activity assay or sometimes detect actually a rare uh, VW, uh, VWF deficiency in collagen binding. And then uh, VWF, uh, uh, and VWF and factor VIII binding activity can actually can be used uh, to uh, detect a type 2N uh, Van Willebrand disease. And then ristocetin cofactor activity induced platelet aggregation at the lower dose of a ristocetin concentration, usually around 0.5 uh, milligram per mil. That's a, 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 a good test to actually ruin or rule out type 2B Van Willebrand disease. So we have about seven um, total tests, and then there are some derivative results. So we have a lot of uh, uh, seven tests to targeting just one molecule. So this is a, uh, so how do we, uh, in a real lab uh, workup, to use these tests and then more effectively to, um, to get our clinical diagnosis? Obviously, we cannot run all of the tests on all of the samples we, we receive. So what is the process or what is the algorithm we take? So here is a very busy slide, and uh, this is a, a, uh, our, the big picture of the algorithm. Many of these pieces are actually within the lab or in our uh, lab information system. So I will just gradually walk you through this uh, algorithm because I think it's important. Once you know the algorithm, I think it will be uh, uh, easier uh, to follow the uh, following two cases. So. If we do have a specimen, we run the three tests, antigen activity and uh, f factor VIII activity. So if we have all of the, uh, them have a normal results, and if the VWF activity over antigen ratio is greater than 0.8, the 0.8 is actually developed not, for, uh, not only for actually congenital VWD, it actually was also uh, taking a consideration of a quart Van Willebrand syndrome in a situation of a patient with underlying cardiovascular disease. This study, the 0.8 cutoff, we developed back in uh, 2011 in a, a JTH paper showing that uh, can provide us with about uh, a 0.9 
or 90 percent uh, sensitivity or specificity of detecting possible type 2 uh, acquired by Willebrand syndrome. And then if uh, there's no evidence of a uh, discrepant factor 8 deficiency, and uh, there's no evidence of clinical features of acquired by Willebrand syndrome, the case is closed, no further testing is performed. However, if we do have a decreased VWF antigen or decreased VWF activity, we usually reflex uh, the Ristocetin cofactor activity because in our hands uh, we felt that uh, uh, there are certain cases um, uh, we also reported earlier in uh, 2011 that there are certain cases the newer uh, method, the, the latex method, might miss, uh, in rare uh, situation, miss certain type 2 von Willebrand disease. So we do the Ristocetin sort of considered as a gold standard to diagnose a type 2 von Willebrand uh, disease so as a functional test. And also is to provide a possible baseline for a future uh, patient therapeutic uh, 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 consideration. And then, or if the uh, uh, VWF activity uh, over VWF antigen ratio is lower than 0.8, we reflex VWF multimer analysis. And then we get the multimer, and then we consider uh, all of them together, and then we, uh, we will actually uh, 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 provide the final interpretation, type two, consider type 2A or B or 2M um, in that uh, direction. Occasionally, we do have cases that uh, submitted for von Willebrand disease turned out to be actually hemophilia A, uh, congenital or acquired. And then in that situation, usually patients have a very normal VWF antigen and negativity. We just follow uh, the existing testing algorithm to uh, address the hemophilia A or our bleeding or prolonged clotting times. Uh, we do the inhibitor screen to rule out the inhibitors, and then we, uh, 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 we go that route. And then in... in, um, in in certain cases, if we do have a clinical picture of autosomal recessive nature and we do have a discrepant lower factor 8 activity, we're thinking about uh, a possible type 2N. And then we consider a type 2N testing. So I didn't define what way to do it. I will uh, describe how do we test type 2N in a, uh, in a case illustration. So now we have this testing algorithm. Um, so how do we use this? Uh, this algorithm in a real world uh, 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 practice or in the lab. So I give you the first case. This is a very interesting case. Uh, a young patient uh, presented with bleeding diastasis. So this is a 20-year-old male, uh, had a significant bleeding after a oral lesion excision, which required uh, emergency room uh, visit and uh, surgical consultation and amicar use. And then um, upon that, uh, after that e episode, and then the uh, hematology consultation revealed that the patient actually, since childhood, had a frequent uh, nosebleed, gum bleeding after brushing his teeth. And also at age 10, he, he actually had an episode of a large lower extremity hematoma after sport uh, injury. And at, uh, at the age of 17, a large upper extremity hematoma after trauma. And about a year before uh, these, uh, 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 the recent clinical episode, and the patient had twice a uh, sports-related uh, in injury and resulted in large ecchymosis despite the patient was actually on DDAVP nasal spray. And then um, and the physical exam was unremarkable. And then we calculate the patient's ISTH uh, uh, bleeding assessment tool score is about 8. And for a male patient, uh, at that age group, is, uh, the normal cutoff is uh, lower or equals to three. So we know that patient is likely to have a, some sort of a congenital uh, bleeding uh, disorder. So his father actually also had a bleeding, uh, a severe bleeding after surgery from the family history. And his sister also had a, a severe menorrhagia, and the mother was fine. There's no uh, abnormal bleeding history. So this is more like in the in a direction of a congenital uh, deficiency. So initial results show the patient is blood type O, and CBC was unremarkable. INR is normal, was normal. APTT was uh, normal. Uh, PFA 100 was uh, uh, unremarkable. And the patient has a lower uh, uh, factor 8 activity, uh, borderline uh, 
normal VWF restocetin cofactor activity, and the VWF uh, antigen level is about uh, uh, marginally decreased about, uh, below the normal range. And then the, we did the calculation of the ratios. The VWF risto over antigen is a 1.23, which is normal. And the factor 8 uh, and uh, VWF antigen is 0.64, is a borderline lower than the, our uh, considered normal cutoff was 0 0.7, or uh, sometimes uh, 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, depending on, it's in some literature use 0.8. So based on the testing algorithm, uh, we now have a decreased antigen, and, uh, and then we perform the uh, multimer analysis, which was normal. And then factor eight inhibitor screen because of the lower factor eight uh, uh, level, uh, which was negative. So a DDAVP trial was actually pre uh, performed, the challenge was performed, because the, based on data, we were thinking maybe we're in the, in the uh, consideration of a type one Van Willebrand disease. So, um, Baseline uh, factor eight was 26, uh, ristocetin activity was 48, and antigen uh, level was 40. And then, interestingly, the four-hour trial, uh, a challenge, these numbers are relatively stable, and uh, factor eight over antigen ratio continue to be in that uh, uh, borderline low range. So we were thinking, okay, differential diagnosis at this point. Uh, we think, given patient's bleeding history, and uh, this is a, a family, uh, a familial, uh, family uh, bleeding history is suggestive for autosomal uh, type of uh, 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 bleeding disorder. And then uh, type 1, just simple type 1 Van Willebrand disease was our consideration because also we're thinking maybe the factor 8 lower because of the uh, factor 8 is a uh, labile factor. And then um, that's just where we're absorbing, uh, uh, observing the uh, the, uh, the label or the, uh, the artifact or that uh, feature of factor eight. And then, or we can think about two other uh, conditions. One is the patient might have type one. On top of that, on another chromosome, the patient might have actually a, a, a hemophilia A, very mild. Or the patient have a type A, a type one. On top of that, there's a, another uh, a mutation on the VWF is causing type two N. So three possibilities at this point. So how do we go further? So first thing, we uh, did not do any further testing. We just look at the existing data. Let's look at the factor eight over antigen ratio. So this is a study we uh, did in 2015 when we were evaluating uh, this particular qu uh, question. So we, in this uh, study, it, it's showing that uh, a patient of uh, hemophilia A and type 2N Van Willebrand disease, they have a, uh, their their uh, factor eight over antigen ratio are all, uh, many of them are lower than 0.7 or 0.8. And many of other diseases such as normal donor, uh, type one Van Willebrand disease, or other type two Van Willebrand disease, they have uh, greater than 0.7 uh, ratio. So this is a, a confirming, a suggesting that we, in this situation, uh, if, uh, this is, since this is an in-house patient, the sample stability shouldn't be an issue. And then maybe the factor eight uh, being lower, uh, the ratio being lower, the, that ratio, there is, uh, the sample is telling us there might be uh, more than just type one Van Willebrand disease. However, just look at the ratio, there's no way for us to separate uh, a mild hemophilia A uh, versus type two, uh, additional type two uh, N Van Willebrand disease. So then we look at the factor eight uh, uh, VWF binding activity. And in this uh, study, again, in the same study, we showed that uh, in type 2N Van Willebrand disease patient, their binding uh, uh, activities are all uh, lower than 20%. Actually, there's a big gap between uh, the 2N versus hemophilia A uh, type one, mm -hmm. other type two Van Willebrand disease. So this is actually a, a good test to separate type 2N from other uh, diseases may, that may be in this uh, sort of a uh, uh, disease patient population. <laughs> so we did a further testing to address type 2N. There are two ways. One is by, functioning uh, by functional test, which will be the factor eight VWF binding activity. The other one is by genotyping. So we did both. And the first one, uh, VWF uh, factor eight binding activity, the patient is 16%, which is lower than our cutoff at 20%. Sorry. 
And in addition, the genotyping showed the patient is heterozygous for type 2N, that uh, uh, arginine 854 uh, uh, glutamine mutation, which is one of the very common mutation uh, in the 2N uh, uh, patient, uh, in the 2N uh, Valbrand disease. So in summary of this case, now we, have, we had a, a patient with a positive personal and family bleeding history. It's very important. And then persistently low uh, uh, VWF antigen and the VWF activity um, or borderline low. And normal VWF multimer uh, uh, distribution. Factor VIII and the VWF antigen ratio uh, persistently lower than 0.7. And then uh, factor eight binding, as I showed, lower than 20% uh, binding uh, activity and a heterozygous for, uh, for this particular mutation of type 2N, Van Bollebrand disease. So uh, we didn't do the whole genome, uh, a whole uh, axon sequencing of this case, but uh, given these uh, clinical and laboratory features, we think the patient's likely having a compound heterozygous type 1 and 2N, Van Bollebrand disease, all in one patient. And this is not unusual, and actually this is our own cohort study. Based on our uh, uh, cohort, we found about six patients in our in-house patients, and they are all uh, having a, a significant uh, personal bleeding history, and also they are uh, showing the uh, uh, abnormal VWF, uh, uh, factor eight VWF ratio, and then they are hovering around 0.7. Some of them are very low. And then available sample we performed retrospectively uh, uh, for the factor eight VWF finding. There, uh, many of them are lower. Uh, three, three cases, they're lower than the 20 cutoff. And interestingly, they are all heterozygous for that same mutation that we just described in our case. So, um, so in the literature, there, this is a, 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 a not uncommon. So this is something uh, to uh, consider when we have a discrepantly lower uh, factor eight activity in a patient with type 1, we think, of Van disease. And then how did we do on this case? This is a sort of a summary. This is a, uh, showing you the case, but uh, this is what we did. Uh, go, uh, we come back to this testing algorithm. So in this particular case, we did a multiple analysis, and because of the abnormal um, uh, 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 VWF activity, and also we did a workup for the uh, uh, factor eight, we ruled out acquired uh, uh, hemophilia A, and also we pursued uh, 2N testing. So that's an example of a, uh, a using this algorithm stepwise to uh, render the final uh, laboratory diagnosis of a, a rare sort of a uh, variant of a Van Bellerin disease. Okay, let's come to the second case, a patient with persistent GI bleeding. So this is a 64-year-old African-American male. Uh, again, the first the age is important. So um, uh, we're thinking about uh, age is uh, possibly acquired uh, condition now. And then the patient had a recurrent overt GI bleeding and seven years history of episodic uh, uh, melanoma and also occasional uh, red blood in the, in the stool. And in the past seven years received uh, over 50 units of a packed red cells. And uh, a scope showed a patient had this uh, very interesting fern-like uh, vascular ectasia, uh, or you can call it uh, uh, angiodysplasia, in many locations in uh, uh, stomach, in uh, duodenum, uh, cecum, and the colon. And uh, the patient has been repetitively treated with argon plasma co uh, coagulation many times. And every time we fixed it, it the patient will uh, actually uh, later uh, bled again. Other clinical information. So uh, the patient had a, a syncope for 13 years duration. And uh, uh, in the past seven years, that becoming more and more uh, frequent. And also later patient with the help of a cardiologist in our um, institution, the patient was diagnosed uh, obstructive uh, variants of uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, and uh, also patient had this uh, asymptom uh, asymmetric septal hypertrophy. So here is showing you uh, a diagram showing uh, in this case that actually the septa is getting thicker and then exactly obstructing the outlet of the uh, blood coming uh, from the left ventricle into the aorta. 
And then actually, uh, the, uh, the, if we put a catheter in the uh, aorta and another catheter in the left uh, ventricle, you actually can see uh, this feature called a broken brow uh, sign, meaning that the red line is indicating this is the ventricle, uh, left ventricle pressure, and then the black line is showing the aortic uh, pressure. And then because of, the, uh, uh, because of that uh, uh, sort of a narrowing and high shear uh, condition, you see this uh, pressure in the left ventricle is overshooting the pressure or higher than the pressure in the aorta. So we did a, a further testing on this patient. The patient had normal uh, CBC. Uh, and PT, APTT, the VWF antigen is uh, uh, 159 and the VWF Ristocetin is also normal. The factor VIII uh, uh, activity is also normal. And then ratios are, the only thing uh, slightly abnormal will be the VWF Risto over antigen ratio, 0.73. And uh, usually for uh, uh, um, acquired condition, we're looking at a higher level at 0.8. So because of that, we uh, did a multimer analysis. So the patient actually on the left showing you the missing of the high molecular weight or very high molecular weight multiple at the top. And then here is the control from a normal donor. So in light of uh, this, we think the patient is likely, uh, most likely is suffering from acquired Van Willebrand syndrome and type two, most likely due to the high shear stress of a patient's underlying cardiovascular condition. So uh, the patient was offered a cardio, uh, 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 cardiac surgery, but uh, opted to do the uh, uh, medical uh, treatment that would be uh, actually considered to be on the bait blocker, trying to uh, uh, decrease the shear stress. And over the next 12 months, the patient had uh, three episodes of a GI bleeding, uh, and uh, later patient finally had the septal myomectomy. This is a before surgery. Uh, the, uh, the blue uh, circle is showing you the septal uh, uh, hypertrophy. And then here is that uh, uh, broken brow sign, meaning here is the line of the left ventricle. Here, uh, sorry, here's the line of the aorta. This line is the left ventricle. As you, as you can see, the very different uh, gap showing the uh, tremendous pressure in the left ventricle and then uh, indicating a tremendous share. And the multiple analysis showing the same uh, missing of the high molecular weight multimers. After surgery, uh, this patient, now you can see that part is gone. And then now, the two pressure lines, left ventricle and the aorta now overlapping to each other, meaning that uh, particular obstruction and high shear condition is resolved and the multimer uh, is actually re uh, resolved to normal distribution. So in this case, uh, for acquired Van Willebrand syndrome, clinical history is crucial because for this particular entity, laboratory testing, there is a, a certain limitation. And usually you will see such patients have a on, new onset of bleeding. And then usually the bleeding patterns are usually mucocutaneous, GI, or post-surgical bleeding. And look, uh, pay attention to that three group of diseases. Number one is autoimmune lymphoma, number two is cardiovascular condition, number three is a throm a thrombocytosis. And then we will work up them in the lab, and then there are type one uh, uh, acquired by Willebrand syndrome in the type two. Uh, multiple analysis seems to be the most sensitive way to identify uh, shear stress related to acquired by Willebrand syndrome. And all the other tests, uh, activity over antigen, they have a certain uh, sensitivity limitation. So recapture this case. In this case, we utilized uh, the clinical history, uh, underlying cardiovascular condition, and also the abnormal ratio, the activity over antigen ratio, and triggered uh, multiple analysis. And finally, incorporation with the, uh, the clinical picture, we report as a acquired Van Willebrand syndrome. So in summary, so today we, uh, we uh, uh, discuss about the general principle and laboratory and, uh, uh, and the clinical features of a congenital Van Willebrand disease, acquired Van Willebrand syndrome, and uh, the t seven tests available for, uh, uh, in many labs that to perform to understand the Van Willebrand disease. And finally, uh, two cases showing you how we actually use this uh, uh, a somewhat complicated algorithm to uh, render a laboratory diagnosis of either uh, Van Willebrand disease or acquired Van Willebrand syndrome.
All right. Thank you very much.